Chris Krohn, here we are. Dude, what's up, brother? Sitting down, having a conversation. This is like so fun for me to talk to you. You're such a huge thinker, and I just love it. It's just great to talk real estate, talk business, talk life. Thank and, you. And we haven't actually caught up. I mean, we're always meeting somewhere in the world. Now that yeah. you live in Puerto Rico, <laughs> it's like we're always meeting up at some event or somewhere, and it's always great to catch up because your accomplishments in real estate are massive. And it's always fun to see what each other is up to and what the level up game looks like. I know every time I sit down and talk to you, you've got some big project you're working on, massive movement in the world. You're, you're such a go-getter, and I just, I love being able to just feel your energy. I appreciate great. it, man. In well, fact, we're talking about like how to really scale and do big deals. Yes. And you know, I know for me, always going to the next level always involves capital, raising capital. Yes. How do I start to bring money into these amazing deals? Because when you learn how to structure, now it's just like, okay, well, what other big thing can I do? Yeah. And capital is always one of those things to, to figure out. You know, it's interesting. Uh, in the whole art and game of, of, of business and real estate, there's always a couple of things that you need. You need a really good, compelling deal with good ROI numbers. Mm -hmm. And then if you have that, you're going to find the money. And then you need someone to structure it and kind of put it together. I call that the deal maker, right? Yeah. So you got the deal, you got the money, and you have the deal maker that's trying to, can I pull investors in? How do I pull this together? And if we talk about it first at a big level and then a really simple level, um, I'm about to come out with my first Reg A fund. And, and what is a Reg A fund? So this is a fund that is designed to raise $300 million. And this fund is something for the first time ever that I can go public with. Mm. I can put it on TikTok. I can put it on all of my social media. I can blast email. And basically the SEC goes through some type of initial review process to basically say, okay, based on you checking off all the boxes, you're now authorized to take your opportunity and you can now publicly present it. So it's not accredited investors only. Nope, it's actually all type and unlimited. Mm. So this is like, you know, putting a fund together like this is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because I've got now a $2 billion track record on all the single family mm -hmm. that I built. You know, we never touch anything less than a 25% ROI. We're actually averaging low 30s. We've been doing that for the last decade. So we've got things so lined up and the machine is so built that we now need a bigger vehicle for raising a lot of money. But I take it all the way back to my early days mm. when I remember the first time I needed money for a deal. And dude, you're not gonna believe this, but I waited 14 months and how I got the money was by working harder at my job. Mm. Over 14 months I saved up five grand and that was enough for a little three and a half percent down payment on my first property. And I bought it 40,000 below market and had a basement I rented out so I got to move in it for free. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was the start. In fact, um, I'm wearing this uh, memento someone commented on earlier. It was uh, from my team, it has the coordinates of that very first property. That's and it's just cool. a sweet reminder that that was two billion in real estate ago. And that's your first deal. That's my first deal. Yeah. And the strategy was just work harder. And I'm like, oh, can you believe <laughs> like going to any one of your students and saying, hey, uh, how you're going to save money for your first deal is just by save for months or years and eventually you have money. It's like, we would never get anywhere. Yeah, with a second job, right? Yeah, <laughs> if you had to do it that way. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. I. I took 14 months, bought that first property. I then, a year later, because it had seasoned, I got a home equity line of credit from the bank for 20 grand, used that to buy my down payment on my second house. So now you're leveraging. I'm leveraging now. And the second house came up with my down payment for my third. And then too soon, my fourth deal came up and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a quick, this is a, this is a quick flip. This is 20 grand. I need 20 grand. It's going to pay back the 20 grand and make me 20 grand. That's 100% ROI in a matter of months. This is awesome. Only problem is, is that none of my real estate had seasoned enough, my three homes, to come up with the money. So I was almost a little depressed. Like, I'm gonna let this deal fall by the wayside. Mm. And- Because you couldn't get the financing. Couldn't get the financing. And I was all, I, this, is, this is a principle that a lot of people don't understand. When you try to do everything yourself, you'll always be at your most limited. Mm -hmm. um, the you're your own bottleneck. Yeah, you're on your own bottleneck. So you, the only way that you can bust through and get some throughput is by figuring out a, a different strategy for expansion and leverage. Mm -hmm. That ended up being my father-in-law, mm -hmm. which by the way is really ironic because when I, my father-in-law watched me buy my first house, I'm pretty sure he was thinking, this kid's a nincompoop. He just basically he's dropped out of college. Yeah, he's like, what's he doing? Like he, he's declared that he doesn't have a major in college. My daughter's gonna be moving in soon. <laughs> yes. Then, um, dude, I bought my second house and he's like, are you guys getting a divorce? Yeah. I don't, he didn't understand investing. He was yeah. like, why do you need two houses? Bought my third house, wrote me off as crazy. But then, right when I was about to turn down this fourth deal, 
he calls me up out of the blue and basically says, hey, tell me about what you're doing. And I gave him my numbers. He calculated the ROI. He's like, oh my gosh, this kid is, this kid is doing something here. <laughs> he ended up giving me the money for the fourth deal. We turned it, we flipped it, we each made 50%. Mm -hmm. You know, I made infinite return on 100% mm -hmm. of his money. He made a 50% return on his money. Uh, let me break that down one more time. He put <laughs> up all the money. I only put in a couple hours of work. And when the 20,000 of profit came in, I gave him half, 10 yeah. grand. So if you were to calculate, oh, he made a 50% return, but if you calculate how long his money was out, he made well over 100%. Yeah. I also made 10 grand, but I put up no money in two hours. So infinite return. Infinite return, and my ROI must have been worth 5,000 an hour. I had never been, I'd never earned $5,000 an hour at that time of my life. And that's, that's Jerry, what opened me up to this world of, I should find partners, father-in-laws. Mm -hmm. And I did, and um, to this day, like 20 years later, I have people all over the world watching my social media, and they basically say, I got some money, Crone got some deals, I'll be the deal maker. And I put the two together, they're now earning superior ROIs that compound into, I mean, a single house over 20 years with my ROIs uh, on paper can, can produce $17 million. Mm -hmm. So for someone that doesn't have a, a strategy and doesn't want to put in the work, doesn't have retirement, it's a great strategy. Yeah, and you know what's great about that, Chris, is like your father-in-law, and my story is very similar where when I first started raising money, I gave away half the profit. Hey, give me the money, I'll give you half the profit. It's a great way to, to start getting money for deals. And when I first started doing that, I remember having this conversation and someone said, man, you're giving up half the profit. Yeah. You're doing all the work, you found the deal, you managed the deal, you're giving up half the profit. And my attitude was, I can sit at home and not do deals because I don't have the money. Yes. Or I can give away half the profit and now I'm doing deals. Is that still what you're doing like today? Or are you doing more hard money? So I leverage both debt and equity, yes. right? Because if I can get debt and it's cheap, yes. I'm gonna leverage that all day long. Yes. Right, so there's a, there, I'm never not raising money because there's always cheaper money to get. Yes. But there's a place for it. There's, there's a certain place for equity. When I say equity, meaning the money, the money lender wants a piece of the profit. They wanna yes. see some of the gain. And maybe a quasi, maybe there's a little bit of an interest they're getting and some equity. Yeah. There's no right or wrong, but the point is just, are you talking to the right people? Are you getting people that are on the sidelines with cash yes. that want to put that cash to work, but they don't want to be an operator, Yep. but they want their money earning money yep. so they can come into like your reg A. Well, and what's the lowest amount someone could come in on that? I'm three just, grand. Three grand, someone's yeah. gonna start I, earning a return I, on their I've, money. I've looked at some of my competitors out there and I'm <laughs> trying to beat them everywhere across the board. That's and, it, $3,000 and you can get in in Chris Crohn's world. Yes. Are you kidding me? That's cool. That's really cool. So you also brought up another word though that I think is important to make sure that everyone understands, which is debt. So you talk about equity versus debt financing yeah. and debt basically means, hey, let me give you money and I want interest on it and I want it back. And I did some deals in the beginning where that kind of scared me Yeah. because it was like, uh, whether I perform or not, I have to do this. So giving up totally. half is a lot to give up, but it also means, hey, if the deal takes longer, we're in it together. Yeah. And um, I've had a lot of people tell me I should graduate out of that, but honestly, my purpose in life is to make other people wealthy too. Mm -hmm. so and equity's so, worked well for you. Yeah, making everyone a 50-50 partner, they, they have this saying, pigs get fat, mm -hmm. hogs get slaughtered. Yeah. So I don't wanna be a hog. Yeah. I'm just happy sharing. And the model works and we, you know, the hardest thing we had to figure out was how to scale single family because, you know, at some point when you're dealing with millions of dollars and then tens of millions and hundreds of millions, it's like, Dude, that is a lot of single family homes. They would be a lot easier if we just bought a, you know, you know, a hundred door complex, yeah. a single deal, you know, that you can take out with a lot of money. Is that what you're doing with your fund? It's not. So really, one of the things that I learned from John Lee Dumas, mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs on Fire, yeah. he says you have to niche down. Mm -hmm. He says, if you want to own a part of this world, you have to go know where no one is. Mm -hmm. So you go niche, 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 and you go into the tiniest niche, and I'm like, well, what niche could I go and do? no one wants to scale single family. Mm. No one, uh, maybe at a re-level where your investors get little pieces. They're not really getting in on the big ROIs that I'm gaming. And so I've created a space for myself. This is just a space that no one wants to operate in. Closest someone could maybe compare me to you is mean, someone. You mean scaling single family on a massive level, like these big multi Like buying homes every doing. single day that are individually yeah. underwritten as rather, opposed to a rather big. Rather than going apartment. Yeah, where you could buy 100 doors or 500 yeah. doors and take it down in a single deal. So you're gonna, con you're gonna continue to dominate the single family market. And I'll you're... tell you why. Uh, I've got some friends out there that are crushing in a multi, Yeah, but they can't get the ROIs to touch mine. Mm. 
And so it's just like, hey, I think too often in the game of real estate and business, we get caught up on strategies, which is, oh, I'm really into this one strategy. I did it myself. I said out of 30 strategies in real estate, lease option is the best. We could have argued it was flipping. Uh, someone could have argued <laughs> it was wholesaling uh, or maybe it was just straight rentals. But come on, really? Like why, why this? And I think it's important at some point to lean in and have a smart strategy because honestly, some are easier than others. Some make more money than others. Some have more risk than others. They should be evaluated. But you should ask yourself, what is the real end goal at the end of the day that you really want? It's ROI. Yeah. And so for me, I diversify ROIs. I need to make some investments where I'm earning a single digit ROI. I need some investments that are producing a double digit. That's my real estate. I have some earning me triple digit, which is um, owning pieces of other people's businesses that mm -hmm. have huge asymmetric upside. I have quadruple digit ROIs where I own businesses that are cash cows. And then I also have infinite ROIs where I'm taking other people's money and turning it into more money. And a person will do better financially faster if they diversify their types of ROIs as opposed to just getting stuck on a strategy. And is that, that's a risk level, right? So like, obviously lower ROI might be lower risk. No, see, I, I, can I real quick? I <laughs> yeah. think that's, I, why? I, I think that's a faux pas. Okay. I think we assume that the lower the ROI, mm -hmm. the less risk, and this, this is where it comes from. Hey, you can, you can invest in government treasury bonds for like, you know, and earn 2%. You know, and you've got these tips, you know, that are doing 3 or 4%. And you can put your money in a CD earning 1.2% because it's safe. And they're yeah. right. But this is what they fail to understand. The wealthy never got wealthy with safe single-digit ROIs. They had mm -hmm. to take calculated risks. Mm -hmm. Here's why. You work hard your entire life. You 401k, you IRA, you do safe stuff, and then you have only 10% of what you need at retirement. Why? Because you, you were safe. Yeah. Here's the way it really works. Wealthy people own businesses, they own real estate, they do things that grow real big, real fast. Most wealthy people I knew did it in five years or less. Mm -hmm. And then what do they do? Now that they have their wealth from a concentrated source, now they need to put it into a safe place that produces a predictable cash flow. Mm -hmm. Dude, if you have $100 million, if you have $10 million, Go ahead, put that yeah. in an annuity at 3% and you'll be thrilled with what that kicks off and you can live off of that. But you can't get wealthy doing that. So what everyone ends up doing are the strategies for what you should do after you have wealth. You'll <laughs> never get wealthy with it. Um, yeah, so I always tell so people the biggest, risk, the biggest risk that you take is by doing all the safe things that are guaranteed to fail you. Well, and the you'll other You'll never thing lose your money. It'll never turn into what you need. Yeah. And what's fascinating about that, the wealthy, they compound, right? So yes. like I look at some of my double and triple digit earnings yes. and that money that's going back into some of those investments. And it compounds. And, and, and the compounding is what really yes. can make something go from triple, quadruple type of return. To something nuts. To something insane because you're putting that money back into that yeah. vehicle. Pros and, and cons, again. right? Pros and cons. People look at me and they're like, okay, Chris, you're telling me that if I buy a home and it produces three or $400 a month of cash flow that someday that's gonna get me rich. And I have to tell them my strategy is for where you wanna be 20 years from now, not today, because it's really about compounding money meaningfully. So if I'm averaging, let's call it a 34% ROI, then that means that according to the rule of 72, my money doubles every two years. Yeah. Well, if you do a doubling effect every two years, after 20 years, 50 grand that you started with a 20% down payment on a home, now is worth over $17 million, why? because of the compound effect. So yeah. it's not, it, it's a get rich over time. Mm -hmm. It's not a get rich quick. And it's not a strategy for someone that says, oh, I need money now, or I hate my job, or can I wholesale real estate, make a few hundred thousand a year? I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, you should do that if you need money. But if you're, you know, you have to balance cash flow needs against growth needs. Totally. And it's, you have to have both. And it's small thinking. I think a lot of times when we're in a place of, at least I was this way in the beginning where, I'm thinking more about paying bills. And I, t I talk about this all the time on my channel, man, do not exist to pay bills. That is such small thinking. There's so much bigger things to do in life than pay bills, yes. live to pay bills. Yes. Freaking get your bills paid and then yes. start thinking about wealth. Yes. And the wealth, thinking about wealth, like I think what you're saying here is thinking about wealth happens right now, the things you do right now, not someday when, if yes. all the stars align, that'll be a conversation I have. No, that's the conversation you have right now. Well, and someday is always tomorrow thinking. It's always tomorrow. And, and anything you can put off for one day is something you can put off till you die. And that's what happens. So I tell people, every day you need to make a decision that makes you financially and your active income stronger. Every day you should make a decision that makes your passive income stronger. Every day you should make a decision that re 
that allows you to reclaim time because you're paying other people to do the more menial tasks that you're not passionate about. And then every day you should make a choice that allows your, philan your philanthropy to grow. What is the give back? Because at the end of your life, what are you really gonna care about? I think we're gonna care most about the contribution that we made in the world, not the money we made for us. Yeah. It's the money that, and the resources that we put to helping other people. And it is a measurement. I mean, you, you told me that you've got a goal to reach billionaire with a B. Yes. So now I'm looking at you making decisions today yes. that align with that. Yes. And I, that's the thing, right? So like, yeah. you're not doing this to pay your bills. You're doing this no. because you've got a vision and a, and a dream way up here. Yeah but it's dictating the decisions you make today well, that and, are gonna allow you to get there. And, and, and the reality is money is a game. And if you learn all the rules, it's like if, if, like if someone got my new book, Have It All, it would tell them where do you go for double digit ROIs and where do you go for quadruple digit. Mm -hmm. So if you just model the strategies that produce the different ROIs and also calculate risk into that. For example, mm -hmm. when I go for triple digits, I plan on losing 70 to 80% of the time. But if I win 20% of the time on a 100x return or a 50x return or a 10x return, it washes yeah. out all my losses. So yeah. it's not putting all my eggs in one basket and saying, oh, there's a strategy yeah. where you almost can't lose. Yeah. And that's what that's I love about, that's what I love about, you know, the, the, the hardest part about making money in the beginning is your first deal. Because if you screw that up, you could lose everything. Yeah. But the it hurts second, more. Yeah, it hurts more. But the moment you get more going for you, the moment you get more money, you got to get into more diversification plan. Totally. I, at the end of the year, I look at it and I say that I win more than I lost. And hopefully those wins are really big and those losses are not so big. But that's really it. You can't bat a thousand percent. Yeah. You know, so that's all of it. By the way, I just want to say if any of you are hearing some ambient noise or just doing the audio and listening in the background, you can't see with your eyes that what we're videoing, <laughs> we are here sitting at Traffic and Conversions. Uh, Jerry and I have met up here. This is the largest digital marketing summit of the year. I'm emceeing and speaking here. We're connecting. If you hear some audio a little bit in the background, that's because we found <laughs> a mostly empty stage with other people, you know, jamming a little soon. background. Yeah. But the, I think that this conversation was too important to not capture. Pass up on, yeah. yeah. Well, I love it, Chris. Thank you. Guys, start to think about how you can go out there and start having these conversations. My initial money raising was the same as yours. It was talking to friends and family, yeah. a guy at church who I thought maybe would lend me a hundred grand on a deal. Yes. Like, but I wasn't afraid to approach those people and yes. start that process. Yeah, and if I could drop one other gold nugget that might be useful, I defined myself at one point as the real estate guy who had a deal that turned into dozens, that turned into hundreds and then thousands. Now over 6,500 deals. And I think I woke up one day and realized, uh-oh, I pigeon, I did so well with real estate. But what I did is I mastered a double digit. And the moment I got mentors that taught me triple and quadruple, my wealth exploded. Sky, well, I'll put it to you this way. 90% of millionaires make it in real estate. 99% of billionaires make it in private equity. Mm. So That's exciting. real estate is where you go to yeah. establish a multi-million dollar foundation. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be bigger than that, you don't do real estate. Mm -hmm. Real estate is a foundation that you build on top of. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Jerry, I, I think I figured it out too late. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get that word out to as many people as possible saying, like real estate is a stepping stone and it's a start. And maybe you're watching and thinking, hey, when I've got four or five million dollars, I'm set, I'm good, mm -hmm. I earn 10% on that, I can live off a half a million dollars a year, I'm a happy dude, and you know what? Happy for you. There are some of us out here, and this is my personal take, is that the moment you stop pushing yourself to grow, yeah. you're dead, yeah. you're dying, you're downhill. The moment you- You're growing or dying. Yeah, and, and, and some of us have already decided, when am I gonna give up on the gym? When am I gonna give up on my nutrition? Like, like at some point, I'm just gonna let myself go. Mm -hmm. At some point, I'm gonna stop caring about investing in my relationship. At some point, I'm not gonna care about money. And um, I think a lot of us are gonna live a lot longer than we think. And for <laughs> me, it's no longer about the outward result, it's about being in the game of growth, of how can I grow and push beyond where I'm at? Because for me, the growth is what produces mm -hmm. the fulfillment, excitement now in the game, not the result. Yay, we made 10 million, who cares? Yeah. Right? It's like, who did you become in the process mm -hmm. of producing that result? That's the only thing I care and about. And the impact in lives. Yeah, yeah, love that. That's really great. Well, Chris, this is an amazing conversation. I know you got to get on a stage here in a minute and excited to continue with our friendship and our journey together. Jerry, appreciate you, brother. Thank you for all the amazing Thank things you. that you're doing in the world. And we will see you guys next time. Yeah.